We're about to move into the slope and stability part of our presentation on natural hazards today. And we've been joined um, by uh, Ian Wright, who's a council geotech engineer with um, Capital Programme Group. And he's given us a lot of input into this part of the natural hazards chapter. Okay, thank you. I'll just uh, begin this part of the presentation by um, referring to the, the life risk model that was developed by GNS Science. We're very fortunate to have that research to help us with our mapping of uh, hazard slopes and stability hazards on the hilly areas of the district, particularly uh, the Port Hills. Um, this information has been used by Sarah uh, to assist with its red zoning and it's also been used um, for the counts, by the council, um, particularly that the red zones um, correlate with the, the cliff hazard mapping and the, the rockfall one and two mapping areas. Um, you might, may recall that the risk threshold um, has been adopted in these models of the one in, in 10,000 year event, which is um, annually, it's equivalent to the risk that we take when we get in a motor vehicle every, every time we do that uh, per year. Uh, there's a differing appetites for risk. This is th something that's been considered a number of times and we've made these pre presentations to the community as well. Some people, for example, are very comfortable jumping out of airplanes and, and going for rides in, in hot air balloons, whereas there's some of us that wouldn't anticipate or, or ha don't have an appetite for that sort of thing and, and don't plan to ever do that. So we, we, we're trying to manage that sort of thing. And that's the sort of thing that's coming out in our presentations to the community. People are saying, well, we know I'm prepared to live with this sort of risk, but really, as a council, we've got to look at the wider community interests and plan accordingly. See, beg your pardon. Um, I just forgot my able assistant here is moving the slides along. Um, this is a... a a caption that we've used um, also before, you'll be familiar with this one, for cliff hazard management, showing the mechanism involved with uh, cliff hazard um, events and cliff collapse. Um, if you refer to your, your planning maps that you've been given today, um, the, the page just inside the, um, the, first, the front cover shows you the legend and shows you some of the, the notation there used for mapping cliff hazard. And so if you have a wee look at that and familiarise yourself with that, and then if you go to uh, the, I'll just show you. <coughs> That's the legend. And on this side here are all the different notations that we use for natural hazards chapter. So if you go now to um, map 48, you can see this cliff hazard mapping um, represented. This, uh, the, the big area to the south there is, um, uh, to the right is the, the Sumner community and you can see wrapped around that community there are areas um, mapped in terms of rock fall, cliff collapse and mass movement but at the moment we're looking at the cliff hazard areas. You'll be able to pick out some of those areas um, kind of on the, the west side of the um, community along Wake, Wakefield Avenue. Uh, the notation is a little bit hard to, to pick out but um, just bear in mind that when this information um, goes live and we use a different type of mapping system people will be able to easily zoom down into their site and see how the various hazards um, apply to their particular sites. In terms of processing inquiries, we're having a few like that. Some people are able to navigate themselves through these maps quite well and also refer, refer to the GNS reports for extra information, but we've also had people that you know, need that assistance, so we've been able to help them by looking at the, the current mapping uh, in the city plan and the Banks Peninsula plan and then giving them a snapshots of these plans as well to help them understand. So just running through Cliff Hazard again, you know, this is the potential for catastrophic failure, very difficult to predict when this might happen, and also difficult to mitigate. Can affect both the top of the cliff there, and in the diagram you can see the cracking and the potential crumbling of the cliff face, and the debris avalanche at the base, which can also engulf buildings. In the case of uh, Richmond Hill, you've got a obviously a red zone and a uh, it's a landslide and cliff collapse uh, uh, issue right around the uh, Richmond Hill Road. That is the only road in and out of that whole area, and I'm just wondering, is there any work being done for lifeline routes 
uh, to uh, ensure these people uh, are able to access or, or leave the area. I know there's a uh, temporary road that connects up through to uh, Mount Pleasant Road, but in these instances it would be uh, important to sort of think about the future. Um, look, I, I don't have that knowledge with me, but we will bring that back to you. Ian does. Do you, Ian? Sorry? Yeah. Beg your pardon. So we've got a um, project lifeline in key routes, um, but those typically concentrate on the main, um, so it's from Sumner across to, to Littleton. We get a lot of secondary roads like Richmond Hill, um, Clifton Terrace, that, that are all um, small roads that feed up into fair-sized communities, and some of those are one access. Um, in and out, so we're aware of it. Um, I guess the good news is that they're not, um, that those smaller ones aren't on the uh, sort of high risk areas. They, they may be very close proximity, but they have not identified it being, uh, as you know, damage. Yeah, just a quick question. I mean, it might be a, a little bit catastrophic, but in terms of looking at what's happened recently in Washington State, and in Afghanistan, where kind of whole hillsides just disappear. Is that a risk in this particular piece? Uh, those, from my ill-informed position, I think they might be equivalent to what we call the mass movement one areas, which are okay. similar type of character. Ian might like to speak to that again. Yeah, certainly I hope you're not the size of Afghanistan. <laughs> um, but the, those are the GNS class one uh, mass movement areas we've um, had identified for us. Their ability to run out and evacuate um, so we do have um, potentially vulnerable uh, community there. We're aware of and manage it. Oh, we're coming to that. We're just moving through the types of um, hazards first. So just to recap again on Rockfall, we've got two areas identified. Uh, one where the, the Rockfall management, one area closer to the source, further up slope. Uh, more restrictive controls proposed there because uh, these areas there's also uh, in potentially a, an intolerable life safety risk. So these areas approximately um, uh, uh, relate to the uh, Sierra Red Zone, although the Sierra Red Zone tended to target the, the footprints in residential sites, whereas um, we're looking at mapping a little bit wider than that so that we're um, ensuring that people are well aware of the risk in these areas. Further down slope, there is some residual risk where it may be tolerable to uh, establish or re-establish development. Um, again, if you look at map 48, you can see some of these areas uh, identified. The, the purple area with the, the purple horizontal dashing is the Rockfall Management 1, so that tends to be upslope, and then if you know your sort of orientation roughly at the contour, you, you may see some brown dashing of the Rockfall Management, um, management Area 2 downslope of these areas. 48, 48, beg your pardon. So where a section has got some Rockfall Zone 1 and some Rockfall Zone 2, presumably if the building platform was in the Zone 2, the Zone 2 regulations would apply, um, despite part of the section has actually got Rockfall 1 zoning? Yes. Yeah, great, thank you. The, the big um, thing about having these controls is to enable um, the consideration of um, hazards beyond the site as well. I think that's important. Um, if we relied totally on the Building Act, we'd only be assessing in terms of the actual site. And of course, with a lot of these hazards, they're from beyond the site. So I'd just like to make that clarification. Could I just ask you um, why the some of the lower slopes are deemed to be a tolerable risk, when I would have thought that if rocks were falling from the top and they were on a full roll, mm. that in fact they were just as dangerous near the bottom is halfway down. Well, I, I, I wanted to say, and I hoped I said potentially tolerable. Again, we're still proposing controls on these areas, but a lesser status of rule. So discretionary activity status for most activities there. Um, with all these areas, just as Janice said earlier, they've got existing use rights. So that's something that people ask us initially. You know, can I rebuild? And we will say, well, you do. You can enjoy existing use rights, but you, we want to make you aware that that hazard exists. And if you propose uh, building beyond your current footprint or uh, changing the scale of your development, then once these rules have effect, they would capture that activity. Uh, we'll, we can go into them once I get, get a little bit okay. further on if you like, but if you want to look at the table, it's table um, 5.10. Yeah. 
and they're all listed there in a the table, so you can work through the activities listed down on the left-hand column. Along the top, there's several, um, each of the, act, the um, hazard map areas, cliff, collapse, rock for one and two, mass movement one, two and three, and then the residual areas, hilly areas of the district are caught in the last column. So that's page 33 onwards. I think Ian's going to say something about the rest of the just the, the, um, the risk is um, linked with the, the slope. The, the less the slope, the less energy under gravity the boulders and the size of Yeah, so basically you start with a cliff, rocks will fall off, pick up kinetic energy, reach terminal velocity, and then as they go down the slope because of friction and sort of gravi lack of gravity, they will slow down. The risk gets less than the you know, because of the, the energies of the boulder and the amount of boulders is less. So there's there's less volume and they have less energy, therefore there's less chance or less risk of people getting uh, killed. But it's not to say a, a boulder moving down at the bottom, if it hits you, it's going to have the same effect. It's just the chances of it happening mm. are less. That's the risk side. Mm. Yeah, and that's the, the model takes that into account. So that's where your most slopes do have a uh, sort of a, a concave, uh, convex, sort of flattening out at the base, and you know, that's when the, the risk lines will will push out, and the low, very low risks will go out into the, the valleys, and they'll sort of retract quickly up the hill um, to the same level of risk. Um, risk. It was an example of that in Dalefield Drive and down in Barnvale Ave. There was a car-sized boulder coming down the hill just bounced around the house on the two top um, developments. It didn't go any further. Now they've red zoned those two ones below, but in actual fact, you're quite right, the, the, the slope of the hill is the same all the way down, yet they've red zoned the two houses at the top and not the ones at the next level. Now it wouldn't have taken much of that rock just to, depending which way it bounced, to pop down into the next, next tier of, of houses. Yeah, so again, it's all to do with the energy. Is the, is the slope enough for the, the boulder? If it did, it may have been carrying a residual kinetic energy, so it had the momentum to carry on. Or if the slope wasn't steep enough, it would have, um, it doesn't have enough energy um, to actually, if it does start moving, to, to carry on. So, I mean, one of the important factors with the, um, the GNS modelling is that it was um, ground verified by the Port Hills Geotech Group, who ran around counting all the boulders, the sizes and how far they got to calibrate those models. So it's a, it's a, we have a you know high degree of confidence in the in the data. No, can I just respond to that too, Councillor, um, by saying that the the um, this Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority had had different um, um, sort of criteria for their red zoning than what we're applying to. We've got some wider controls and dictated to by the Resource Management Act and also by the various statutory um, documents, including some produced by the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, but also for the re uh, by the Regional Council in its regional policy statement. And they've certainly um, become a bit more stringent um, since uh, the earthquakes. And they were sort of firmed up a bit um, about the end of 2013. So we're having to interpret those as well. Yeah, so as a result, some of our, these hazard map mapping areas actually extend beyond the red zone. Right, next so now we'll recap on the uh, mass movement uh, hazard management areas and um, as um, Councillor Manji was mentioning before and asking if there is any comparison between those events in um, Afghanistan and um, Washington State recently and um, from, um, as Ian was saying too, they'll roughly compare to that example on the right hand side there which has got some of the characteristics of cliff collapse and that it's very unpredictable and um, with the potential for um, life safety ri risk, uh, catastrophic failure, and you can see there where those buildings were inundated, and it's, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's terrible that we've got those examples, but it, it does help, you know, uh, to, for us to understand uh, the risk there. Less of a risk for the, the area, um, for the example to the left there, potentially that represents the, the mass movement two and three area where there's risk more to property, less likely to life, but more to property and to infrastructure. Um, and you can imagine if somebody's in, uh, got a property at the, at the top there in that extension zone, and we've certainly had an inquiry about that recently, about the, the implications for that. So there is a lot of inv information available to people rebuilding and building, both from this council 
and through the Ministry of, of uh, Business, um, Innovation and Employment. So that's mass movement one. Um, and they're, um, they're the, the sort of uh, blue, like a, a turquoise blue. They're a little bit hard to see. If you see um, in map bar 48, sort of about the middle of the map where it says Sumner Beach, there's a big area there. That's um, approximately um, the eastern end of Peacock's Gallop. And it extends there. So these are the areas that are being the subject of further GNS research that's going to be reported on any time soon. Um, was a turquoise ones, yes. So they sorry, Ian. Just the one, just the diagonal hatching. Mm. Yeah. So you'll see it um, where it says some on the beach. There's it's like two eyes. There's the one one circle to the right, and then it says Kinsey Terrace, and then there's another blue circle to the left. That's right. Correct. Well, there's a number around. If you follow the cliff face around, there's, there's a number of them. Um, if you, you know, look at Red Cliff School, where you can see that there's, along that cliff face there, there's three. Well, as I said, this, this report is, um, is pending, and um, there is going to potentially, I understand, Ian might like to speak to it in a, in a fairly brief way, but there, there are implications in t for the Council, potentially, the, the Council will be informed about the, the implications in that report and what actions could potentially be undertaken. I guess the good news is that um, a lot of the Class 1 mass movement areas are associated with the existing cliff flaps areas that have been red zoned already. For example, at Redcliffe School, you can see it sits in a red zone. So in that case there, what GNS is saying is that um, although if there was a failure and it acts as a landslide, a mass movement, the area below that it's going to inundate has probably already been taken up by the, uh, the cliff collapse model, so it's not additional ground in that area. So it's not all bad news. So I'm assuming that we've used that information when it comes to, say, um, subdivision consents yeah. on the upper part yep. we have. Yeah. Yep, and, and, and um, we, we can take you through that in more detail. Thank you. In saying that, though, that either of those models, if they actually went, no amount of foundation works going to right. hold that house in place. That's right. So there's really no way to mitigate a house moving with either of those two models. And that's why there are different rule and activity standards applied to various areas. Just to clarify, if there's an existing house here and it failed, either on the, what we call the source area before it runs down or that's below in the inundation area, the um, probabilities of somebody uh, walking away are very low. Um, that's the real risk. The upside of most of these ones that we're looking at is potentially there's an engineering mitigation solution that we can uh, we can do to, to help that. So that's that's one of the, um, the things we're working through at the moment. So we don't necessarily have to abandon the areas and the runout areas. We can, um, bearing on you know certain assumptions, we can actually get in and uh, remediate. So there are no um, mass land movement areas identified on the Banks Peninsula side of the hill. So Littleton, for example, hasn't got any identified areas. Is that because there aren't any, or is it because the work hasn't been done yet? Um, I'll try and make this very clear. The, the Littleton <laughs> side was assessed post-earthquake, and there were no mass movements um, defined. Now, that's not to say that there were no areas of land damage and areas that potentially may fail with slope stability. But what's really important to try and understand is that the, uh, the, the GNS mass movements were identifying large areas of ground that was damaged during the earthquakes that may react as a landslide. Throughout the whole of the Port Hills, we do have slope and stability issues that um, we call our business as usual. It's not necessarily related to earthquake damage, so we do have what we typically refer to as slips. And we, you know, again, Littleton, the last rainfall events, we've had a, a lot of slips there, um, but those aren't identified as these larger mass movement areas. 
So that only identified, this work only identified earthquake related mass, move, mass land movement areas, not so much mass land movement that could be caused by rainfall and so on. Because, of course, as you say, we have seen quite a bit of that in Littleton in particular and other areas. And there are residents who might possibly be expecting to see on these maps that those things would have been identified. Yeah. Can I just respond to that, that the, the mass movement areas that have been identified were identified by the scientists when they were out doing work in respect of the cliff collapse and rock hazard areas. They started finding cracks in the ground, and so they've effectively mapped those areas and then done further study and classified them. But as you say, you know, there's potential for other areas of the district, um, and that's why we've got that other rule in the table for remaining areas, hilly areas. Um, so we're effectively taking a precautionary approach, particularly at the moment we're targeting subdivisions so that we can require that assessment. Now I'll just come back to your earlier question too about um, the uh, Littleton side. There, there is map 52, actually maps um, quite a bit of the Littleton township. Um, it's showing primarily a mix of rock 41 and two hazard mapping. Yeah, that's, that's entirely right. I mean, that would be accurate and would be correct, but um, I was surprised not to see any um, land movement areas on the Littleton side. Less movement. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so just, just to emphasise, throughout the Port Hills, slope stability um, is an issue. But we try to separate um, mass, all these terms, mass movement, slope instability, landslides, they all generically mean the same thing, that the ground's going to move in some way. The, the mass movements that uh, we talk about are uh, what GNS reported on from earthquake damage. Um, they're not saying that there's not other land instabilities, small s slips, etc., that occur throughout the whole Port Hills. You know all those cracks that you've now got registered on the Port Hills all over the place that you know so well, do you know the impact of putting water down those? Um, fundamentally, yes not very good. Um, it can only reduce the strength of the, the rock mass, so it will create some sort of instability. Whether it creates a failure or not, uh, may, may not always manifest itself in a, um, in a slump or something, but it's certainly not going to help the situation. It will always invariably um, make the situation worse. So having measured all those cracks that you've got all over the Port Hills, are there ways of measuring the impact of water on them over time? Or is that just unknown? No, some of the, um, we don't monitor obviously all the cracks, some we do, especially in the um, mass movement class one areas where we drill boreholes and we call it, we put a, uh, a clinometer down which um, measures the, um, whether the, uh, the land mass is moving so that, that the angle of the borehole over time and some of them have got piezometers which measure the, the amount of water um, infiltrating, so we do get an uh, idea, um, but like a lot of geotechnical uh, things, it's it's not a black and white science. Um, you know, there's a lot of grey, and so there's, we don't, we you know, we just can't measure every every crack. That there's going to be a lot of grey in any rock um, science, but is there any sort of indication um, of what's happening? So our monitoring in the mass movement class one areas um, to date, um, Bar Cliff, um, Cliff Street, which is one that um, is ongoing, has an ongoing movement associated with it, to date, um, under normal or rainfall um, conditions, we haven't seen any movement. Including the last three events we've had now, they are still um, they are safe behaving.